Welcome. I'm Ann Baxter with the Foster in Palo Alto, California. Today, we're talking about Falls of Shadow, eight paintings that comprise one artwork that Tony painted in 2011 for an exhibition at Gerald Peters Gallery. Tony, you were invited to participate in this group show in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which addressed the use and misuse of land in the 21st century. What prompted Gerald Peters to put that exhibition together, as far as you know? Jerry has always had a keen interest, really, in uh, not just in American landscape painting, but also in, in, which, in which field he's a real expert, but also in, um, also in uh, the general way uh, landscape is not just depicted, but it's also the way it's used. Why did you choose your title, Falls the Shadow? I have a little bit. It's from T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Men from 1925. It's uh, between the idea and the reality between the motion and the act falls the shadow. I suppose I interpreted that to mean that we, we might think a positive thought about something and think that we could do something positive about it. But then if, when, when the act occurs, a shadow falls between your original idea and, and the actual completion of the whatever project you're engaged in. And, and it seemed to me that that we all of us, we none of us, um, uh, deliberately go out to destroy or, or abuse uh, land. But on the other hand, it still happens nonetheless. So between us not actually intending for that to happen, it still happens. And, and so it seemed to me that that's, the shadow falls over your, your best intentions. And then the so. last lines are the most famous, I guess. So... Uh, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Yeah. So it's, uh, and, and that's a, obviously a very well, well-worn phrase, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And, and uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's very prescient. If you think about it, the, the things that we're facing now, um, if you read the scientific reports on what, what's likely to happen unless we change our ways, the world will and not with a bang, but with a whimper. I mean, us, us children of the 60s always thought that the world was going to end with a bang. We, we, we felt we were under threat of nuclear a nuclear holocaust um, because we thought, felt that, that some, some careless person would press a button and that would be the end of a lot of us. Uh, and it would be a big bang. Um, but, but we've come more to think, have we, as we've lived with atomic weapons for a very long time now, uh, and luckily nobody's, nobody's yet... Um, thought to start a war with one, um, although we did end the Second World War with, with two, but nonetheless, no, nobody has voluntarily started another one. Um, and so we've come to think that now uh, it's not the, the threat of nuclear weapons so much, although they are still a threat, of course, but it's more, much more likely that, 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 that we will simply peter out because we've been so careless. You created these series of paintings from wildernesses that you had been to in the past. So each of the eight paintings we noticed is from a journey of the past. Yes. I simply reduced bits of the original paintings that were done at the time. So the dates which appear on the paintings are the date of the original work. In other words, that's when I was there sitting there doing the painting originally. And then this, this is a little copy of it, really, which I made for this particular purpose. I, I just extracted a, a detail in some cases, or I just reproduced the work to a small sketch or a small painting. This is a pass through Bates Mountains, organ pipe desert done in 1991, part of my Arid Lands series. And it was a hike I did with my dear friend, uh, Bill Brace through organ pipe desert to the Mexican border. And uh, I can't remember how long the journey was, six or seven days, probably. This is really a section of a painting I did of that pass through Bates Mountains. We hiked through that pass there. And talking to the local volunteer rangers, and from our own experience, we realised that the, the, the reason that I've got a little model of an um, ATV is because the rangers were saying what a curse these things were in the desert, because the desert is absolutely beautiful, it's quiet, it's clean and it sparkles in the sunlight. And, and you get these things buzzing through. It destroys the solitude, it destroys the silence. And, the, and of course, quad bikes are bringing the road into the desert. They, they crush lots of vegetation and they are a bit of a curse really. And so that's why I 
put those two things together. This is Shiprock from Mesa Verde done in 2010. I was artist in residence in Mesa Verde National Park when I was doing my Sacred Places exhibition. Shiprock is sacred to the Navajo. I was given a lovely Hogan, which was a lovely uh, little tiny contemporary building half buried in the Mesa and worked very happily there for several weeks. I can't remember quite how long now, but yeah, it was several weeks. I think. And so, so that little painting really identifies a, a key to that place. Part of the, the um, furore, I believe, that was taking place at that time was that, that mining companies wanted to start mining around Shiprock. And they never, this caused a big row amongst in the Navajo Nation uh, with, with many of the, the, the people trying to fight off this, this um, what they considered to be an assault on their tribal lands. And so, so that's why I thought a piece of coal was the obvious thing about the threat that that particular place faced. So this is Moosehead Lake and Spencer Mountains, uh, done in 1984. So this is um, my early days of wilderness travel, really, in America. And this was when I was doing a series about Henry Thoreau. And so, of course, Thoreau did journeys in the main wilderness along the Allagash, the Penobscot, and across Moosehead Lake. And so with my dear friend, uh, Parker Huber, we canoed across Moosehead Lake and I did a painting. It was just, um, you know, a very exciting experience for me, um, never having been in such a big landscape before. This was really my first experience of wilderness because wilderness isn't really a European concept. Most of Europe has been walked over and fought over and generally owned by people for hundreds or thousands of years. Whereas America seemed to have, I learned, has areas where you, you have at least the sense that very few people have ever been there. And that to me was the most refreshing and interesting idea. And this is where I came up with this idea that, that wilderness was a thing to be celebrated. So that journey was very important to my subsequent work as an artist and to my inspiration, really. In this case, the bulldozer is the threat to this place because Moosehead Lake, a large area of it, had been owned by a logging company. And then it was bought up by a development company. And their intention was to turn part of the shores of Moosehead Lake into an industrial warehousing area. Part of it was going to be um, tourist accommodation, part of it was going to be uh, a town, part, they had just dreadful ideas for it. And in fact, a huge hue and cry was set up to stop them doing it. Uh, in fact, I contributed towards the campaign to stop, put a stop to it. So that's why the bulldozer was the threat in that particular painting. This is the Grand Canyon, of course, Yuma Point, and it was, this was done in 2007. Yuma Point is down in the canyon, it's, um, I'm pretty sure it's about 2,000 feet down. It's, it's just a spectacular view. I made a special expedition to paint there, I think when I was doing Searching for a Bigger Subject. So this would have been taken from that painting. We had to make two trips down to Yuma Point in order to get in our, all our food down and so on for me to make a, a big painting. And our chief concern was water. You know, there's no water there. And you had, so you had, I was worrying about having to carry enough water for 10 days, which is a hell of a lot of water, a gallon a day each for two people. That's a heck of a weight. But luckily, when we got there, we found lots of potholes. It obviously rained fairly recently and they were all full of water. And so we thought that was, that was a wonderful thing. So the threat there is not the threat to Yuma Point, really. It's more the threat, I think, to the Grand Canyon itself. And, and of course, you, as you can see, there are, Dozens of tiny, tiny people are stuck in a plastic box. And, and this is a case, I think, where the Grand Canyon is having to cope with enormous numbers of people visiting. I know somebody has done a survey and discovered that the average visitor to the Grand Canyon only looks over the rim for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is pretty extraordinary to me because I've looked over the rim for months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but, but, um, but nonetheless, whoever visits feel they have had an experience. I mean, it's not it's not up to me to decide how long people should stare over the, over the edge for. Um, people have whatever experience they have, but all of them feel it's an exciting thing to do, and it's one of their lifetime experiences. The problem is, of course, how do you deal with numbers on that scale? Trying to, all trying to see the same thing. So 
my threat to the Grand Canyon, I thought, was just the press of people. This is, um, this is of course, Yosemite Valley, Yosemite Valley, uh, the Merced River, done in 1986. After my work on Henry Thoreau, my next major project was about John Muir. And of course, if you're going to do John Muir, then you better damn well start in Yosemite Valley. And this was the, the jumping off point, really, for my subsequent 225-mile hike along the John Muir Trail, where I made a whole series of paintings. So this was an important place for me. I've been back a couple of times since, and generally I've tried to keep out of the valley itself uh, since. Because uh, if you're there when it's, when it's not too cold and not full of snow, it's always full of people who all arrive in cars. And so the threat in this one are those two little cars. There's no getting around the fact that the, the Yosemite Valley in the summer simply turns into one gigantic car park. People get very frustrated. Um, they get cross, they get upset because they've traveled a long way to come to see this marvelous thing. And all they could see is the tail light of the car in front. This is near the Ho River on the Olympic Peninsula. And this little painting was taken from a bigger painting done in 2000 for the Watermarks series. I was camped in amongst this extraordinary, uh, these extraordinary huge trees. The whole place was dripping wet. And this little part of the painting shows really the trees that, uh, that I was camped under, covered in, in moss and epiphytes. But it was very clear to me that, that the threats to these places, the fights were still going on about cutting down first growth cedar trees. And as you can see, the threat to it is a man with an ax. It seemed to be a sort of symbol of, of the way we treat these beautiful stands of fantastic forests. This is Castle Peak from the Sawtooth Mountains. And I've done a lot of work in the Rockies around uh, what might be considered almost my home from home, really, which is Sun Valley, Idaho. This is a painting from a journey I did in the Sawtooths in 1994, the first uh, series of paintings I did there. And I hiked up into the Sawtooths in order to make a group of paintings about that particular mountain range. Uh, and this is Castle Peak, which is a very prominent peak in the area. The threat there, I thought, which has unfortunately come horribly true in the last few years, was simply the threat of fire. Enormous fires have taken hold around the area in the last few years. So that little plastic box simply contains uh, lots of dead matches, indicating, of course, that, uh, that fire is, is the big risk that they face in that area. This is Imperial Geyser Yellowstone, and this was born by Sophia in 2002. I, I have sort of fond memories of Imperial Geyser. I was looking for a, a geyser that was reliable. In other words, it would go off regularly. So I, so I didn't have to get it all in one shot, as it were. So I could sit there and watch it time after time to make sure I got it right. But which wasn't a tourist attraction. Because, of course, uh, Old Faithful, you know, the massive tourist attraction, quite a lot of the areas around Yellowstone are tourist attractions. It's hard to get away from people. And when you're sitting doing a big painting, you know, you need to be able to concentrate and you can't, I can't do that if there are people peering over my shoulder and asking questions all the time or chatting. And so I spoke to the rangers and they said, well, you could take a look at Imperial. That goes off pretty regularly, about every 20 minutes. And I said, well, that's perfect, every 20 minutes. And sure enough, the thing went off regularly as clockwork every 20 minutes and gave me every opportunity I needed to be able to actually figure out what the water looked like when the thing was at its highest and it's spouting and get, catch that sense of it spouting and falling at the same time and steaming and, and obliterating the landscape in the steam and so on. It seemed to me that the chief threat there really, uh, wolves had been released in, in the park. And it was a huge controversy amongst the ranchers who all have ranches all around the edge of the park. The wolves, of course, you know, don't know when they're crossing from the park to the ranch lands. And the ranchers, of course, were concerned that the wolves were going to destroy their livestock. The landowners held the right to shoot the wolves if they saw them. Um, and so the poor old wolves really were either confined completely to Yellowstone or they risked um, being shot on sight, as it were, as soon as they crossed the border. So that's why I put a bullet in the, in the plastic case. In a way, everywhere I've worked is under threat in one way or another. And I could probably identify the threat with every, for everywhere I've been, which is rather depressing, really.
But something like, um, you know, the actual destruction of rainforests, uh, once they're gone, they're gone. And, and it's that kind of thing which is, is uppermost in my mind really at the moment. Um, the fact that, that uh, there are places in the world which once they're destroyed, there is no getting them back. And, and that's, a, that's a terrible thought. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for your time and for sharing your stories and the history of all these artworks that you made. <laughs> yes, who would think that those eight little paintings could tell so many stories, really? That's, that's, that's rather, rather gratifying.